thank you for being here. Um, quite excited to have such a crowd of people that are interested in helping wildlife get across roads without getting squashed. Um, and if you're outside, you can come on in and grab a chair. And you can tell them where to grab chairs. We've got staff right Oh, okay. Grab a chair and come on in, I guess. Okay. Um, and so I, I've always said, and I've been saying it for a long time, that um, Park City is a place where the people know how to make things happen. And I believe that you, the audience, is one of the most savvy, politically um, active, smart about how you do things group within the entire state. So congratulations for some of the things that have been happening here lately and how you continue to uh, persuade UDOT and Division of Wildlife to do more for wildlife in the neighborhood. So Ron Rock Park City, Kimball Junction, Jeremy Ranch, and everybody else. Big <laughs> cold. <laughs> All right, well, this is a project I'm on. I wanted to explain this one um, because you guys are so in love with moose. I had to put that moose on there. Um, I'm, on a, I'm on a project in Colorado on State Highway 9. I'm trying to think. Of, I mean, I have a whole lot of pictures from there. So um, State Highway 9 runs north-south near Steamboat Springs, um, and there's a lot of animals getting killed there. In fact, people getting killed, too. And so um, a, a very um, lovely entrepreneur put in millions of dollars to get CDOT to start doing things. And so this overpass went in, and we had cameras up at the top and on the sides, um, but somebody was driving along um, from, his name's on there, from a Blue Valley Ranch, and he got this picture of this bull moose going over oh, in front of the And so um, let's, let's uh, like have this vision for, for Parley's summit that this will happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2018, 2019. So I will give you um, an overview of the um, slideshow. I'll talk about the problem of wildlife and transportation. I won't show any slides of roadkill because I think that's terrible Thank to you. tell. You guys see enough of that. You want to see that. Um, but we'll talk about why wildlife need to move. We'll look at the solutions of what you can do, what the world can do, and then the research that I do, what I've been finding out across the, the West. So um, I have lots of sponsors, and it's amazing if you look at those uh, emblems. Those are lots of DOTs that are um, supporting my research, so it's very exciting to see them getting on board um, and helping to see what's the best thing to do because it is becoming part of doing business to care about communities of people and ecosystems and wildlife as part of what they do. And wildlife agencies and um, amazingly the sportsmen's groups, sports people's groups, on the bottom there, have um, they, they have a partnership with UDWR and have given money to So the problem of wildlife and transportation, just some stats that will have pretty pictures most of the time. Um, there's over 4 million miles of roads in the United States, and up to 20% of the land is somehow impacted by roads. And here's a perfect example. How many of you have hiked hills and mountains here, and you know Interstate 80 was miles away, or US 40 was miles away, and you could still hear it? Have you experienced that? You, can, you know, get to your pinnacle of your climb just to hear traffic. And so that gives you an idea that it's not just the road itself, it's the, the salts that wash off the road and into streams, it's the noise, it's the animals completely avoiding the area along the highway. Um, the, several groups have looked at, well, how many animals get killed, we don't know, but you can easily say that a million vertebrates, or backbone animals, are killed on the roads every day. Every day? Every day, easily. Like, I'll give you an example. How many of you have hit something from a bird up to a moose. How many have hit an animal with your vehicles? So at least half the people here hit something. Um, but that, the birds get hit a lot and we don't have to have a lot of And about 1.5 million wildlife collisions annually. Um, about 200 people die on average each year hitting animals, and that's not very much. So like, if the stats of what they, the annual amount of people that were killed on highways um, overall has been 40,000 ish and then went down to 30, now it's back up to 40, and I think that was something to do with texting. Um, so we have this big problem that's the equivalent of a jumbo air airline um, plane crashing every day on our roads, the amount of people that get killed every day. So several hundred people every day, and that's not enough to make us do more to help humans, so it's really hard to motivate people to do stuff for wildlife. So I always have to do the safety work with the engineers which is, leads to the next things. Why do we need um, 
protected wildlife linkages and wildlife crossings. So we have the ecological reasons and the safety. And I, I live in the nexus of um, what engineers need and then what us people that are more ecologically minded want to happen for wildlife. And so, um, for instance, on the left side of the picture there, you'll see some San Joaquin foxes. Um, should I put the, maybe we can um, dim the lights in the front here. They can see there's little animals in this slide and you can't see them. Two, and the ones above you as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, you guys can see them. Turn into a song. Yes, I see your head Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now you can see the fox. So these are San Joaquin foxes in California. Um, oh, it's, it's quite blurry. Oh, wow. Um, and they they literally have a burrow on the side of a highway there, and they're trapped by roads. They maybe have a, a hole underneath that fence, but they need to move. They need habitat, and there's lots of reasons you know animals need to move. But the, the big thing is the way that I get the DOTs involved is to look at the safety aspect, and a moose is incredibly dangerous. In fact, if you have a, a Saab or a Volvo, those those cars were designed in Sweden to hit a moose, and they're very well um, ergonomic, well not ergonomically, but they're, they're enough of an um, aerodynamic pattern that the moose rolls over and doesn't kill you going through the windshield. So um, the safety factor is the big hook that I use for um, the DOTs. <coughs> And so um, I worked with National Geographic back in 2008, and we, we played with some numbers from State Farm, and they made this map. And this shows how many reported deer vehicle collisions there are in every state. And you can see the East has a lot bigger problem than we do in the West. They have the white-tailed deer. Like places like Michigan and Pennsylvania have over 100,000 reported deer vehicle collisions a year. And then ours are only about 3,000, 3 to 5,000. 3,000 are reported as crashes, and 5,000 um, that are reported um, to the um, uh, insurance agencies. So our problem isn't as big as they have it, um, but we have this added part of like, well, the species that we're killing can't keep it up, whereas the white-tailed deer somehow can keep keep um, keep up with the amount of deaths. Um, so I'd like to go into the ecological reasons why wildlife need linkages or protected areas and crossings. Um, so on, on that picture there are two um, Puma or mountain lion walking through a culvert in Montana. But I'd like to give you some stories. I think, I think the human brain has been really evolved to remember stories rather than think facts. And um, you know, having been a professor for years and talking to blank faces that have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I apologize. This, there is a blurriness to this that I don't typically have. I don't know, you guys at Swan are here, if, if you can make it less blurry. Um, let's see. Oh, I got my laser. Okay. I don't know if it's the projector, but you could normally the words and the letters. This is a, this is a crappy slide because I didn't see on green. But I'll tell you a story about an outline. So, um, researchers, um, um, Mike Wolf and Dave Stoner at Utah State University, gave me this great slide, they, 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 they radio collared her or GPS collared her? They GPS collared a female puma um, outside of Camp Williams and they wanted to see where she would go. Thank you. Because I, I, I knew, I'm, I, I'm like, I've seen these slides before. Right? <laughs> and so we look at the dispersing sub-adults to try and understand where we need connectivity for animals that need to move out of the population and across the landscape. So she traveled down here um, and then crossed Interstate 15 where we actually have a wildlife crossing. Mule deer go in and out of there. That's right near like mile marker 200 um, near Scipio. And then she came down here, bounced along Interstate 70. She did not cross it. And then she went north. And this is all in one year's time. She went all the way up to Wyoming. Wow. And so like in eight months she was in Wyoming and then she came back down. Um, if you went to us, and she wound up in dying in Colorado. And to, to study carnivores is to, is to have a broken heart. And I study mount, uh, mountain lions. I study Florida panthers for my dissertation, um, and I know a little bit about heartbreak. And I don't know if I could do this because um, it's legal to kill these animals. And so that animal did all that amazing stuff, and then she was legally shot. And so it's a bummer. But the hunter gave the collar back to the researchers and they got all this great information off the collar, otherwise they would have never known she left the area. They never would have guessed you went this far. So um, I'm going to tell you a few more stories and they all end kind of sad and I'm sorry, but if we, we could get over the sadness and just look at the connectivity issues, 
um, that'll, that'll just give you amazing respect for animals, which this audience already has. But um, here's another one. So a mountain lion was hit in 2011 in Connecticut, which does not have mountain lions. And his DNA was from the Black Hills of South Dakota. And somebody just didn't pick him up in South Dakota and dump him in, in, in Connecticut. Um, there were confirmed sightings and also some um, genetic material and scat left by him as he moved somewhere along this 1,800 mile journey from South Dakota to Connecticut. So he's probably the record holder for the amount of um, distance. And then all those rows of people that that mountain lion moved through. So they really are motivated to move. Here's another animal, and I wanted to say it's not a mountain lion, her name is Thelma, and this audience, not the students in college anymore, know Thelma and Louise, the movie. <laughs> and so Thelma was, or may still be out there, a middle-aged female on, on a journey, and uh, the, the biologist in Saguaro National Park put tracking devices on her, and they followed her, and the red dots show that she moved 30 kilometers, which is like, say, 15 miles to the south, to the Santa Rita Mountains for the winter and then came back north to Saguaro National Park. And she had trouble getting over the rail line and uh, across Interstate 10, so the biologists were out there and they saw dots coming through, oh, we gotta go help her. And so she, she moves this, this pattern every year in the winter time, in the spring and spring and fall. And I was wondering, what, what do you think she is? What species? Tortoise. Tortoise, very good. <laughs> so this story gives you an amazing respect for tortoises because she knew how to do that before we put the rail line in the highway. She might have, I don't know that she could be older than the rail line, over 100 years old, but she certainly was older than Interstate 10. And so this is an amazing story. I don't know how that happened, but I, I did magic without even trying. Oh, the, the, yeah. It was me. I thought that was <laughs> um, The amazing thing about her is that we should really respect tortoises because they're older than we are. They've been on the landscape far longer than all the things we throw in their way. And they know where they're going and what to do. And we think she's picking up sperm over in the Santa Rita Mountains and coming back and you know, diversifying the gene pool. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And so, um, Okay, and that input thing will go away, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, we'll try to make sense. Okay, great. So, all right, all right. It's that story because dead wolf is up there. Um, the another wolf story, uh, a wolf story, because these are the carnivores. These are the ones that move. So this is a Yellowstone wolf. She she was collared way up there um, in Montana, north of Yellowstone. She was part of the Yellowstone crew, and um, GPS collar. And so she came down, and she decided she was on a mission, and she. Um, went through Wyoming in the mountains and she came over and wound up in Logan where I live and was on the hills here. I have some more data on her looking at the highest points, looking out across the valley, seeing if she wanted to go west. And all good wolves know that um, carnivores are not welcome in Utah, so she hightailed it out of here <laughs> <laughs> um, into, into Colorado, but she did all these things in Wyoming. And she wound up in, Den uh, excuse me, um, not too far from the Blue Cliffs in Colorado, and she was poisoned, um, which is really sad because I don't think we should have poisons out there. It was poisons for coyote, and the rancher was really sad because he didn't really want to kill a wolf, and she was pregnant. So we could have had a whole pack of wolves in Colorado from her. So she went over a thousand miles. So my, my point with these slides is to show how amazing animals are. They need to move across the landscape. And I was just talking with uh, Pam Kramer from UDWR on the way here. She's telling me about what pelicans do. Like pelicans out there in the Great Salt Lake, they go to Guadalajara for the, for the winter. <laughs> Who would have known? <laughs> oh, and here's, here's, was that a much, let me see if this is, yeah, this is her, so 341F. Here's where she went through, um, here's a couple of her locations here. She was on this peninsula looking across the valley and went through. So um, just amazing. So animals need to move, we've established that. So what are the potential solutions? Um, here are mule deer going through a box culvert, um, US 30 in Wyoming, not too far from here in Nugget Canyon. And you can see it's actually their first time going through. So the three, the three problems of solutions are looking at wildlife and how do you get them under or over the road looking at the humans and trying to get them to slow down or whatever we need people to do to, to stop killing wildlife. And then, oh, I do have a road kill. Sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a vehicle kill. Um, and then the other part is planning. And that actually, you can play a role in that because you can influence planning in Utah. So um, to establish that you have a problem, to get UDOT to 
listen to who you are. You have to establish that you got some data to show there's a problem. And Ralph and his group would um, say, people say wildlife have been very good at documenting animals getting killed on I-80. That's really great to show. You know, it'd be great you know, to show them the pictures too. And so I've been using wildlife people closure data points to plot maps and so have other people to show the DOTs where the problem areas are and it shows you where wildlife need to move. But we also have this great app. Um, I need to do homework on this app tonight because they're going to ask me tomorrow about this. Um, so um, Dan also who's returning to Utah um, in a week or two. He, for his PhD, he worked on helping to develop an app with UDOT, UDWR, and UDOT's GIS folks. And it's on the phones of people who are um, registered users that are allowed. It's not for the public right now. And so it's um, UDOT, UDWR people, uh, maybe some highway patrol. And when um, we have contractors pick up the carcasses, and when they do that, they're supposed to push a button, open up the app, and it records exactly where it is. They just have to do the species, and the gender, and maybe age. And so this was um, uh, past two years. So this is two years of data to show you um, how many, this is almost all deer, but there's also elk, and there's down the prairie dogs in there. But this shows you where our problem areas are. And so this really helps us show you doubt where we need to, next time you have a, a project like the climbing lane, hey, you got to stick some sort in there for wildlife. So planning. So we also have like people that make maps for connectivity. And maps are great with their hypotheses. And I, 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 I modeled for my dissertation. I know modeling is great, but I find that too many modelers are, are not forthright enough to say, this is our hypothesis and ideas where the connections are. It may not be exactly where the wildlife want to go, but I just proposed to UDOT on Monday, please support a project with me and Wild Utah Project where we'll start to map areas where we know the wildlife are moving. So we need to look and see what's left of what vast amounts of land they used to move and, and, and work to protect that and put them crossings. So um, here's some hotspot maps. Almost all Western states have created, that's New Mexico on the right, and um, let's see who's that on the left. Um, um, Arizona probably, so then California, um, this is a Colorado one, this is Washington State, on the, uh, Oregon, Washington, okay, Washington, something, and then um, I made this, my, 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 my people made this for South Dakota, and then uh, my, my team also made this for um, Idaho, and so Idaho worked a lot longer and harder than those other maps, and actually came up with where the hot spot areas are that they should be working on, and they're doing a pretty good job. So get that data, map it, and say, here's the problem areas. Um, on the wildlife side, to get those crossings in, we want to come up with where do we put them, which is the hotspot maps, and then what are the best designs. And so the most effective mitigation is wildlife crossings and fencing. Um, all the places in, in the Park City area do not ever suggest that we have a crosswalk and uh, flashing lights for drivers so that the animals can get through four lanes of traffic because that won't work. It was tried on US 40 and um, the only way that works is if you have two lanes of traffic, they're going under 55 miles an hour and there's less than 2,008 um, average annual daily traffic. So um, the solution is wildlife crossings in this area, totally. You can try and slow people down, which is great, but um, people typically only slow down on average five miles per hour when warned, and so it's really hard to get them to slow down anymore. So a wildlife crossing is a, a culvert or bridge that was designed specifically for wildlife. I put the yellow in there because I did a national study and people were like, oh, we just put a fence to the culvert. It's a wildlife crossing now. And I say, no, 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 I'm a hard ass. You, you had to have made it for wildlife. So on the right, um, this picture of Wildcat North, which is under I-15 and Mom Marker 123, where I-70 and I-15 come together. And on the left, it got cut off a bit, um, is, a, is a man standing by the eight-foot-high wildlife fencing. And that's the most effective way to get animals under the road. There's other culverts. Um, on the left is that same culvert um, underneath Interstate 15, um, Mom Post 126 near Manderfield, or where I-70 and I-15 come together. On the right is a big culvert in the north and northern part of Idaho. And then even smaller culverts work for smaller animals too. So that's how we typically get them under. And then again, this is getting cut off a bit, but the, the bridges, um, they don't even have to be that high. It turns out that height is the least important um, structural dimension. Um, so we have bridges, that one's black white-tailed deer in Montana. And this one here is pregnant female. You can see how her belly. She'll give birth in about two weeks after that picture. Um, these are underneath I-70, mile post five, right near code, code four. Um, this works really well. 
So we also have overpasses. So on the left is again that overpass in Colorado, and, and there was a group of deer going over and somebody caught it. Um, there's also this overpass for uh, desert bighorn in Arizona, and then the one on the right, um, other famous overpasses in Banff, that was where the training before the vegetation. So the, the one in Banff is um, 150 feet wide. This one here is only 50 feet wide, and then the one um, we have Colorado is 100 feet wide. So they don't have to be that wide. The one you'll be getting on uh, Carly Summit, um, the division can only push as far as 75 feet wide, which will be a very long, thin overpass. It only is wonderfully square. It has to do with loading um, and the amount of lanes it has to go over. And we can talk more about that later. Um, Pronghorn Antelope were on, um, started using overpass in Pinedale, just south of Grand Tetons and, and Jackson. Um, they are really skittish. They won't go under the road. The only way to get a pronghorn is safe, um, safely on the other side of the overpass. So there's two overpasses for them in Pinedale. Um, we put escape ramps in, and you know about this, especially um, say people say wildlife can pay for escape ramps. Um, this helps the animals escape the road area if they get trapped in there, and they do work, they do jump down. Then at all the places where people have to drive through the fence, either roads or driveways, we have to put in double cattle guards. And so I researched those too because we're trying to figure out the best design. So a double cattle guard, this is down in um, the Ponscount, a Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, we're studying the Ponscount herd. Or um, a wildlife guard, we have these up in the Wellsville Mountains. And in the past, we did electric mats, but they're not working so good. Anything we can figure out what to do. It turns out these two designs Double cattle guard and wildlife guard are the best designs. They're 80 to 90 percent effective. There's always going to be um, yahoos, particularly um, in the rut and when their testosterone is really high. Just like teenage boys, they fall you know, and fall in and get their way through. Um, I did a study. It, this was actually what brought me to Utah. Um, John Missinet up in Utah State University had a postdoc position, and I got it. And I looked at what we were doing across the country for wildlife a while ago, um, and at that time in 2007, there were over 800 wildlife crossings in Utah and Canada, and then aquatic, there's tons of culverts that were retrofitted and created co correctly for fish, because in Canada, they made their laws that said, thou shalt not block the salmon, and so they, they valued their salmon. Now we're retrofitting everything in our country, in, in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, to try and help the salmon, but they, they did a great job in Canada. So this was a this was a labor law. This was years and years in the making. This um, this uh, map. This was I updated as 2010. I had to get um, Nevada had zero for the longest time. Nevada's gone gone to town. We now have 45 wildlife crossing structures in Utah. And so the leaders are um, Florida, um, Arizona, Utah, and Montana. Montana now has over 100 terrestrial crossing structures. And so when I, when I did the study, I was trying to understand, well, what makes for good crossing structures? How do you get them? So I couldn't do stats because I was like, well, Vermont has, has 8 and 5. Vermont has 13 and Texas has 10. So I was like, OK, it's not the size of the state. If the big state has less than one of the smallest ones. And then I said, OK, topography. But then Florida was the leader. And I know Florida because I live there part time. It's flat. So it's not pop, it's not that. Um, and then I looked at endangered species. There is something to that because Florida, a lot of their their crossing structures are made for Florida panthers and black bear. So there is some degree of of building them for animals that are protected by the Fish and Wildlife Service. But in the end, I work with all these people, and I learned that it's the people in those agencies making it happen. And it's less than ten people per state that really make these things happen. And you have to get them on fire about it. So um, I, I couldn't do stats on that, but it's just amazing how some people were gone, gone crazy. And like, for instance, I, um, Wyoming's got nuts too. Wyoming's at least 10 times a guy now. So people are catching fire on this. So um, I wanted to look at our research and how we study the animals, what they like, what's the best thing to do. And this is kind of interesting, so this gets more scientific um, on the talk here. Um, I always teach my students, you know, I should have a tattoo on my head that says, what's your objective? Because that's so important. Everything matters. What's your objective? I'm always asking people that. And if the objective is to see how many animals come to the structure, and then how many go through, and how many turn around, then you put the cameras, again, this is cut off picture. You put the cameras outside the entrance, 
and facing near the entrance, you can see this camera took this picture, what the deer were doing, because they don't all go through. If you put a camera in the middle of the culvert, you could have 20 elephants at the other end and not know it. So you really need to put cameras all over to see what's going on, and who you're doing good for, but who decided no, it doesn't work. So um, what I do typically when I work with UPWR is I make these graphs, and again, it's kind of blurry, but there's blue and red bars, and the blue bars are the animals that approached, and the red bars are the ones that went through. And then you can also see this is time on the x-axis. Over time, we have uh, migrations twice a year. And what happened is, in the beginning, there was a lot of blue bars sticking out there without red partners. But just in a couple of migrations, they started to even out, which means they were getting used to the structures. And we'll talk more about that. So the projects, um, just to give you an idea of some of the things that I've been doing in the West, I've worked with Washington State to look at what's out there already and what you can get the animals to go through. And so we learned how elk will go underneath something as short as nine feet. I um, worked with um, Oregon on Lava Butte crossings just south of Bend and, and designed their research program. Um, did a big project for Idaho to get their hotspot map that I told you about. Um, also had a major project with Utah that um, I finished a few years ago, and it was award-winning. Um, Federal Highways gave me an award for that. So I was really foolish and took on way too much work. Um, and I monitored 15 wildlife crossings and like 20, 25 other structures all over the state so that we could get an idea of what our elk and mule deer and moose will go through. Um, did a, just finished up the Montana study, eight-year study, and looked at white, white-tailed deer in the Bitterroot Valley. Um, just finished up, uh, yeah, I'm very busy, South Dakota, their wildlife hotspots and working on a project um, in Colorado looking at that overpass and underpasses and then I just got a project helping the bottom map what they've got where they've got their problems. So um, zooming in, I gotta it's like I need one of my own soon. Um, but it's it's really rewarding to work with agency people. I feel like the salt of the earth and they really do want to make it a better place. So it makes me pretty happy. Um, so this is a Utah study, and we go into Utah a little bit. I have sites from all the way from Logan all the way down um, to south of Cedar City and, and over to south of um, Monticello um, here. We, we have cameras all over the place, and what from all those structures all over the place asked do wildlife crossing structures work? Well, in six years, I document 43,000 times plus mule deer went through structures. So yes, wildlife crossing structures work. Very easy to say that. And I looked at the wildlife crossing structures and then also um, just the plain old culverts. These are up and moving. Yes, wildlife crossing structures. Yeah, work. Um, this is, oh, this is a movie, so I have to um, uh, come back here. Sorry, I'm just going to get a lot of activity going here. So I string my pictures together. So I put the cameras there. And the cameras take um, several pictures and we string them together. These are on YouTube. And I, I, this one's slow. The other ones will be faster, but... Almost. And I watch this baby grow up, and every year I get to watch the babies grow up. So the mamas take the babies through, and so this is in July. This is outside of Rodeo. And see that baby's grown up from July to September. How far did the moose roam away from where they're born? I don't know that answer to tell you the truth. Um, once they grow up, they, I'm sure they would, can go miles from, from where mom My was. My wonder is, do the babies continue to come back and forth once they know about it? Do they? Yeah, they grow up. Yeah, they, they, they've learned. Oop, oh, there was another uh, one there. Yes, the babies learn from mom because it's not, it's totally against their instinct to go through these structures and so mom teaches them. This one is really funny, okay. This one goes by really fast. I had to give you an intro to really get your brain, what the heck's going on here. The first camera is the same one that you've seen. This is bull moose comes in into the, the culvert and then the rest of the film is the east side camera and then after all the action, it's back to the west side camera. And so the name of this is Unexpected Company Can't Moose Get Some Sleep in a Wildlife Crossing. <laughs> So he comes in and he takes a nap like a dog. <laughs> and she tries three times to go through. And she's afraid of him. And then she comes over and she smells right by his butt. <laughs> now watch just quickly. There's a red fox then. And then he smells the fox. Watch him. 
He's, and so he just gets totally in the way. <laughs> so I just thought that you guys would appreciate that. Um, so the I-15 overpass works for mule deer. Um, it was the first overpass in North America. The first one was built in 1975, and the other side was built in 85 when I-15 went to Divide Highway. And when I first saw this, when I first saw it in 2004, I laughed. And I'm like, that's just like a walk to the beach. They're not going to use it. And then I put a camera on it, and over 400 times a year, mule deer go back and forth because they got to migrate to the desert for the winter and go back to those hills for the summer. And you can see them all online and follow that lead matriarch. <laughs> what she does, and that's only 22 feet wide. So if you look at your overpass a few two years and go, oh, it's only 75 compared to Banff, you know that you have more than, than this first one. So what are the best crossing designs? Um, this is on US 6, a mile marker 220, Mary's Road, before you get into Helper. Um, the bridges are best. We have um, like 84 to 95% success rate with bridges because they're wide and open and they're worried about predators. They're worried about that mountain line. So they can see if they feel they have escape cover, bridges work great. And so that, um, I strung together pictures on that particular bridge. Uh, we call it Beaver Creek Crossing. It's again, it's on US 6, it's not on I-15. Um, and this is great because in the early years there was no vegetation, nothing had grown back yet. So you can really see them um, adapting to it. And then a lot of snow comes in the winter. Once the snow gets up, you know, in their armpits, they stop coming in until April or May. And I think this goes into the snow months. We migrate back. Yeah, it starts getting snowy. Okay, great. So, just to show you, this stuff really is working. Um, so, I looked at um, wildlife crossing structures in Montana. And these bridges were brought in after the design. The person that's the wildlife was the wildlife person. He came in to the job after everything was designed and he couldn't get the bridges very high, but he did get bridges instead of culverts. And that was a major experiment because these are bridges that are not even five and a half feet high. And um, the, the whitetail adapt to them. They, they're okay. They have that left and right escape cover um, and it worked out okay. I do want to say that there's something here going on with light. She, that's flies too going on, but it's dark underneath and it's really bright in the front. And watch what happens when snow comes, because that changes the dynamic. Here's the boy coming after. <laughs> <laughs> the girls show the boys in the fall. So she, she, she's not quite sure. And I think because it's so dark there, then the snow comes, now watch, watch the reaction. And so there's such a contrast of the bright and the dark, it took them a while to get used to it again. So, so I have a problem with elk. Elk are the problem child. We cannot get them to use almost anything. They don't like to use any structures. And so this is on a box culvert on I-70 on Monopole 6 at the beginning of I-70. It was made for farm equipment and hunters get the cows back and forth. It wasn't made for animals. It's 230 feet long, 17 feet high, 17 feet wide, and the elk will just not go through it. And I've had cameras on there for like eight years. <clears throat> a couple of elk will go through. The boys will go through, but the lead matriarch, if she won't go through, the whole herd won't go through. So they have to convince her, and we haven't figured out how to convince <laughs> the matriarchal females how to go through most anything. Can we them? Yeah, you can, you can bait the uh, crossing structures. We did that up in the Wellsville in, um, by Bogan, um, and they came in eight, and then they never came back again. <laughs> so we'll help these wildlife crossing structures. This is a really funny story. I thought you guys would enjoy this. These are, these are um, young bull elk at a really, a really nice arch where I showed you the pregnant female. So this is I-70, mile post five. It's in a really beautiful Tusher Mountains area. They have to get through. Um, my research showed that they're just going right over the highway before we put the structure in. And again, it's fairly big arch. It's like a, it's a bridge. And these bull elk, they're young, and they've never seen it before. So this is three different cameras. This is at the wild side. They're they're 
walking around trying to figure out if they should go. There's three of them. Then I need to pause this. I don't know if you caught, catch this. These are these are buck deer. The deer are coming on the scene at the same time. Really unusual. They don't usually like each other, and the elk usually scare the deer, but the deer know what they're doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, whoa, sorry. Push that. Let me try it again. So, watch. This is this is the solution. So the elk will go through. The deer teach the elk. From the deer and then the elk are right behind them. So, so I, when I go to other states, I offer, we have trainer deers if you like. <laughs> Um, this is your this is your neighborhood. Does anybody remember when the first three miles of wildlife fencing went up between Mountain Dell and Lambs Canyon yes. in 2009? Yes. So UDW, uh, excuse me, UDOT didn't didn't make enough money. They'll say they didn't have enough money. They didn't make enough money for double cattle guards on all the entrance and exit ramps at those interchanges, and they thought the animals would just go right underneath the highway on the paved roads where the road where the cars go. And um, Jackie and Tim Fair, who were very active in all this a couple of years ago, they helped me install some cameras. And um, this was one of the funniest things that ever came out of those cameras. <laughs> so this is Mountain Dell entrance ramp um, from um, the south side of the highway going eastbound. And they thought that if they painted white lines that they would fool the animals that, that, that they can't walk onto the highway. Well, in just three months time, I documented 200 Deer, elk, and moose, and this guy's just laughing. And the, and the, and the engineer who, who said that his work, he chose this, and he says, "I take full credit. That moose is laughing at me." <laughs> so it was really great that the cameras could show people. Well, you, you know, the biologists say it doesn't work, but we didn't have proof. So then UDOT went, found money, and got more double cattle guards at all those entrance and exit ramps. So that helps keep them out. Although, you know, this winter, this is the area that the elk got on when they closed the interstate. So, um, here's another question which I would have thought the answer was not no. Can we convince mule deer to change their migration patterns? This is on across US 89 down by Kanab, um, and they go from Bryce Canyon, this is the Pontagon herd, and they migrate down into Arizona for the winter. Not all of them, but a, a fair amount, thousands. And then they come back in the summer, and they're coming back right now. So. Um, I'll show, I have to show you, set, set this up for you. So, um, the mule deer, oh, here's up there. So, the mule deer are coming down from Bryce Canyon, and they have to cross 89 to get to Arizona and these other areas. Now, they don't all go here, but um, they were collared um, uh, 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 like 10, 15 years ago. And mile post 39 is called Telegraph Wash, right, by Buckskin Wash. That was where the majority of deer were going. And so um, uh, UDWR told UDOT, you've got to put a bridge there. That's where the deer want to go. And I don't know why they didn't do it. Again, they always talk money, but I, I know that that's just a smoke screen. So um, you've got a bridge here, Buckskin Wash, that was there. Because Buckskin Wash carries a lot of water. You had Telegraph Wash Culvert. And I'll show you. It's really small. That's where all the deer are getting killed over the road. And, and it stayed instead of replacing it with something bigger. Then. UDOT put in three culverts, and they did them exactly to the designs that I was finding, which is that you have to keep them short, not long, and then the deer will go through. So they put the culverts in an area that, you know, put a nice bunch of crossings throughout this 12 miles of fencing, but it wasn't exactly where the deer wanted to go. So we actually had to make the deer go uphill in a place they, that they normally didn't um, and migrate. And then there's also petrified wash culvert and Siemens wash culvert, and these are pretty good size. But these are new, and so I wanted to show you what I learned from my um, research. These are these are the, the wash culverts that used to be there, and they the, the height varies because of all the sand, but 23 feet wide, 77 feet long, I mean, nice and big and open, no problem for the animals getting through. And then these are the new culverts. Um, they, they helped me put the cameras up to actually um, welded the cameras to the culverts so they couldn't be stolen. And so these are the new culverts. This is a new design. It's only it's less than 100 feet long, um, and it's it's a it's a nice straight shot. That's a beautiful buck. They don't get any bigger than that in my cameras because if a buck wants a big huge rack, it does not come anywhere near the road. Which means if a buck wants to live a long time and happens to get a big rack, 
is because they don't come anywhere where people can shoot them. So this is the problem culvert. It was where the animals wanted to go, and it was way too small. Cows go through it, and even horses go through it, and a few deer go through it. But by and large, most deer, and I'm telling you this in case you ever get involved with UDOT plants, most deer do not want to go through a seven and a half foot wide, high, six foot wide culvert. It's, way, it's like a little cave. They just don't want to. Some will adapt, but this was exactly where they wanted to go, and we didn't get um, a good structure. This is Buckskin Wash, they, they no problem, like 95% success rate, that's great. Um, and so what I did is I did these blue and red bars again, I'm gonna do a little science here. And so the Telegraph Wash culvert, the first year, look at the blue, where there's thousands of times the mule deer came to it, but only um, like maybe 120 went through, times that they go through. And this is where they needed to go. So we had to train them to come over to the, um, one mile to the west, and one mile to the east to change their migration. And I really didn't think they'd do it. But this, take a look at that red circle, and then that's where we wanted them to go, where the yellow circle is. And then the next the next um, couple of years, they stopped going to the telegraph one, and they moved a mile to the west and adapted to the new culvert. And so I was really amazed. I would have said, no, you couldn't do that. but. Um, mule deer adapted much better than they have in the past, so you can train them. And this is key for your overpass. We need to find a way to train your mule deer, your moose, and your elk to find that overpass um, and use that to move across the interstate. So how would you do that? This is the fencing. I, 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 probably, I said 12 miles of fencing, but I didn't say it very well. So eight feet high, 12 miles of fencing, and then double cattle guards at any place where there were ingress, egress roads, and then it was, it was just too difficult to do anything but what we wanted them to do, and they eventually found those, those culverts. They walked the fence line, there was lots of traffic problems and problems with hunters, and UDWR sent letters to hunters the next year saying, if you've got a tag with um, the ponds got hurt, do not stand there at the end of the culvert and shoot them, or drive them onto the fence. There were some problems. Um, so they got very respectful, which is really great, because the first year people were all over. But the animals run, walk the fence line until they find these culverts and they, they, they find their way. And so they also, um, so I have counters at the end of the fence too because we want to see end of fence runs. So most right of way fence is just a couple strands of barbed wire or um, field fence. And then this is the eight foot high fence right here. And so the deer were coming around it, but um, when I plot the data, and I'm still out there, this is all the deer that went around the fence the first year, 2014, 2013, 14. 2015, you see that it's decreasing. They're learning to adapt to the crossing structures and stop going over the road. Mm -hmm. So here's some here's some shots from that. They, you know, uh, tough conditions. I must have moved here something. Now, what do I have here? This map can't connect to the iCloud. Later, dude. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're almost there. We're almost to the end. And. Um, they're doing really well. So I have, I document over 3,000, I may need your help if I don't get this to, um, you got it? Okay. So let me go back. So I have over 3,000 times, over 3,000 times each season, mule deer go through these structures. So there's at least 3,000, sometimes they're back and forth, but I'm guessing there's about 3,000 mule deer that use these structures. And so they just come in these droves, like this is going on right now, like that's March 24th last, a couple of years ago. Um, they're just amazing amounts of mule deer just coming up to the structures. A lot of times they follow the lead female. And so this is my last slide, which is all about you guys, which is never doubt the power of a few individuals to change the world. It's the, indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, and it's Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, and I really believe that that is the total truth everywhere we go, that people make the difference and can make it happen. So thank you. Yes, in the green shirt. Are there any of your publications available like online? Yeah, that's a good question. Let me think about this. Um, yeah, we have a we have a website called wildlifeandroads.org. Um, it's based out of Utah State University, and there's some information there. And then, um, if you would like to, my you can email me, and I can send you links to some of these because the Utah ones online, UDOT published it, and some of the other ones are as well. And then, if you go, so it's wildlifeandroads.org. Um, and also, if you go to YouTube and you type in um, Utah Wildlife Crossings or Montana Wildlife Crossings, 
we were coming up first, but other people get on board and start to throw things in there. But you can see some of these videos and share them with engineers to say, look, oh, it really does work. So, yeah. Yes. So, so the one here, the crossing at Jeremy, that's been a problem. Is that going to be a big culvert or overpass? It'll be an overpass. overpass. It'll be a Harley Summit uh, oh, area. Like Harley Summit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you think they'll move up to go up on a top? Yeah, so there's a lot of problems. I mean, we've been trying to do this for over 10 years, and they're slumping on, on both sides of the highways. Anybody, a geologist here, can tell us about the, the, the unstable soils in the Harley Summit area? You can see it, especially now that the snow is melted. You can see that the, the soils are unsteady. We were, um, a group of us went out with UDOT, you know, over 10 years ago, and, and the geologist came and she said, you can't put anything here because of the unstable soil. So it's going to be geology and engineering more than it's going to be what's best for wildlife. And you need the, the land on both sides protected in perpetuity or, or public land so that there's no development, because right at part of the summit, the best place is going to be development on the north side, which is probably the ones on the south. So there's an engineering company, Michael Baker is the main company, is working with UDWR and UDOT. They've had a meeting, they have more meetings about where to place it. And um, so I'll tell you my opinion about it, and then I know that some of you have a different opinion, but I worked with uh, another consulting company when the climbing lanes went in down by Mountain Dell, and I looked and found out that there's a big push to get a recreational path from here to, to Salt Lake. And the plans that were drawn up by their consultants showed that somewhere near Lambs Canyon and Mountain Dell, most closely to Lambs, we should have a culvert and overpass for humans. And so I'm okay with saying that overpass for wildlife could be for humans. The people can have it by day, the animals can have it by night. And you've got your evidence on, on the mile post 40. I forgot your name again. Oh, how beautiful. That's the elk? Yeah, my son got here. What's your first name again? Jessica. Jessica, Kirby. you can tell everybody what you found that you're yeah. at the Colbert Center. So I work for Beast and Recreation, and we've had a wildlife camera underneath the underpass on Highway 40 for a year. And efforts between Park City, Heine Theaters, and myself, we've um, caught multiple deer, mule deer. But the exciting was we got elk this year. So we do have elk going through. Um, we've been very excited to get those pictures. Coyotes, rabbits. Um, some straight are, you posting, are you posting those anywhere? Um, we have posted some of them on our Facebook page, okay. but we haven't posted this one yet. So, okay. um, right. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I'll do that um, next That'd week. Cool. But yeah, I'll send this is it's a good story because not too many people want um, humans and wildlife to share. But sometimes I think it's the only way to get eight million dollar wildlife crossing going. And um, we I, see in day and night, so it's, yeah, yeah, it's, I'll see a deer go through yeah, and then six bikes. So, wow, yeah, okay. great. Yeah. So, Steve, one more thing with that overpass, and then we can, uh, I'll get to take some more questions. So, but I know that there's people in the community that don't want people walking around up there, but there's a golf course there, so I'm not really sure what the problem is. But to me, that's that, that'll help. But the high elevation aspect. The animals need to use that area before the snows get too deep. And the moose may be able to use it in the winter, but the other species won't be able to. They should be out of that area um, in the winter time. So it's, it's a it's a tricky situation, but um, you need to more. So the animals really will use it if people are using it too? Yeah, they won't use it at the same time, but no, yeah. yeah. They will really use it. Yeah. What about cougars and bobcats and things? Do they go through them? Um, yeah, mountain lions and bobcats are around, but um, they're so rare. They're so yeah. rare. This is not a carnivore-friendly state. Um, mountain lions will come through like at the very, very most once every couple months because they have such huge home ranges that they they go in and pee a big circle. Um, they keep going back and, and pissing on their little thing like Keep it up to date. <laughs> exactly. Um, so and then bobcats. I found bobcats will even use the small culverts. So bobcats are more adaptable than mountain lions. But the people that study the mountain lion that I put the picture on, they said that mountain lions go and sleep in culverts. That's where they usually go to find them. Okay. So mountain lions and bobcats are very adaptable, yeah. and they're almost always at night, and rarely, rarely they I was going to say, too, we had a speaker at our Save People, Save Wildlife meeting last fall mm -hmm. who said that moose stay within a 10-mile radius of where they were born. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And that's why when um, uh, wildlife people People like here in Park City say, Oh, I don't want to lose in my yard. And they move them like over to the Uintas, mm -hmm. they don't survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew that was going to come up. That's going to come up tomorrow morning, too, on the radio. Well, they're um, the moose, they don't want people in their yard. Right, so the, the moose, the moose is your beloved animal. Um, the moose, 
um, are sharing the same space. Um, we moved into their home, so we should be sharing their, their home with them. Um, the Division of Wildlife gets in a really tough situation, as you all know, I'm just reiterating what you know, that if you call them, they have to move the animal. They go over to the Uintuas or even toward the Bookless because they want to expand the population, but they can't handle the heat down towards I-70, like any moose on below I-70 is rare. And, but I, they, you, you guys know survival rate's not good. I am totally against moving bear and moose and everything else. Um, moose are coming into states they've never been in before. Like the moose that when we started with it, northern Colorado, Colorado didn't have moose years ago, and they're starting to get moose. And so all over the country, moose are moving. So they move, they'll move tens of miles. I don't know how many because I'm not a moose expert. But they, they'll, the disperses will go very far. So. Um, yeah, Moose, Moose uh, they want to live here with you, um, and they, uh, and they don't want to live like in the places they get dumped. Don't call you dumb bar. Never do. Are you worried about funding cuts under this new administration? Oh, so I'm like a reporter. Well, <laughs> uh, because I live on, yeah, I don't have a, a set salary, and so I was thinking about that, but if, if um, um, if, if infrastructure is important, which I believe it is, because a lot of our bridges and everything else is falling apart, then transportation agencies should be okay. And if I can just get what they call decimal dust from the transportation agency. Right. Yeah. How do you guys know what that means? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of guess. yeah, I think I'll be okay. But um, I do have um, colleagues that are like USGS consulting with GIS mapping and other things that will be in trouble, but I think I might be okay um, because the DOTs don't seem like they're under threat from the current. Um, I'll go to this side of the room. Yes. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, the Nature Conservancy has done quite a bit to look at wholesale wildlife borders within the, within the United States. And have you done any, any work with them to try and um, locate animal, safe animal passages through some of the, you know, the interstates, which are big and Yeah, yeah. So um, I work with a lot of groups, and um, uh, uh, one way everything will come together is around the week of May 14th. So there's a conference coming to Salt Lake. It's International Conference on Ecology and Transportation. Another long name, ICOET, I-C-O-E-T. It starts May 14th and it goes to May 18th and will be in the, um, the convention center, the Salt Palace. And um, it's all about transportation wildlife, but excuse me, transportation and ecology, but most of it's wildlife. And there's two movies that are going to be shown. One is sponsored by Wildlands Network and the other one's Y to Y, Yellowstone Yukon. And one of them was the guy, John, I forgot his last name, who like hiked from Mexico to Canada through all our western states to try to... Davis. Davis, thank you. And so um, you will have an opportunity, it's open to the public, there's going to be screenings of these two movies. And so there's a lot of different organizations talking about wildlife connectivity and wildlife and protection, and it becomes these pinch points through these the highways. And so... Um, we can get animals to go through culverts and, and um, bridges that were there for other reasons. And so I've not worked with TNC. Um, I, do, I do meetings with people and I give my two cents worth. Um, but we do need to band together, more groups need to band together instead of get, getting off on their high horse like old people. So those movies are coming in May. Yes. So more of a more local thing. We have a pretty significant elk migration going through you know, Jeremy Hart in the old by um, Trailside. And I recently saw a, a YouTube video of about 20 female, female herders, about 20 elk, literally just jumped right over that eight foot fence, <laughs> walked across the freeway right at, right at Jeremy Ranch. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. so I don't know that, that, I mean, I don't know that too many things is going to be the answer for this migration. They, they need to move, you know? Yeah, Rob behind you has a comment about that. Uh, yes, uh, I would say people save wildlife. And I watched for the hoof prints. If any animals went up to the fence and jumped it this winter, not one. Not one hoof print was on there, so I take exception with that. We have that. to figure out where um, that is. Yeah, no, I, so I can, you can not water jump you, you, you can see it. You, you can recognize the golf course and see the cars all coming to a screeching halt. Wow. Because uh, really? yeah. yeah. the snows were high enough, maybe further up. Yeah. It could no, be from Jeremy. Well, actually, I don't, I don't think it was in winter. Yeah. We just saw them three days ago. No, last week. 
They jumped the fence? By Route 40, 40, yeah. 40, 49, Route 40, they would jump the fence, yeah. We, yeah, definitely get those pictures together, because I don't think you'd have to know there's a um, commercial, First there was a commercial elk farm on, on the road out to, uh, through uh, Hannah and all that, mm -hmm. and they have, their fence is 15 feet, so. Wow. Because they, they all pretty, they, they jump know. pretty good, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's really tricky, because like I said, elk are the problem child, and if you don't give them what they want, yeah. they will pull your fence down, jump your fence, go up your skate yeah. ramps, go around the end of the fence, and get caught on I-80. So, um, one thing I can say to the problem with elk is that overpass is not done. Um, yeah. You need more wildlife crossings, one every mile, yes. basically. Yeah. And the, um, Nell was telling me, Nell, did you tell me about the moose that went through the culvert right here? Yeah. That was yeah. years ago. Just it was. Doesn't it was like eight years ago. Do any more go through? I have never seen, so Patty's referring to the little pedestrian underpass that runs on, under the highway right here. We saw moose coming out of it. Um, and I've never seen any other route. Oh, okay. Yeah. But there's a couple of other key places that we need to try and get them through, but they don't share the <laughs> very well. Yes. Patty, that overpass down by the, the base of the um, Mountain Dell uh, Reservoir there, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's the cars. But do the animals use that by chance? <coughs> to go underneath? No. Oh, the, oh, further up. They would walk, walk on. Uh, yeah, I recommended to you, Dot, that they should do some, some things like put fencing along it and maybe put uh, take some asphalt out so that it's just dirt. But we don't know because nobody's ever photographed that area. But they have to have fence to, to, to uh, convince them to do it. Um, but I, I have I have put in my reports to you that they should adapt those old passes to the west um, for wildlife too because people the cars hardly ever use them and yeah. maybe, maybe animals could once in a while. So we don't know. I had I, I do want to clarify something because I might sound like a smart ass here. Um, when the fence went in in 2009 between Mountain Dell and Lambs Canyon, I put cameras on the Mountain Dell interchange both sides and the Lance Canyon interchange both sides to try and see if we could, and I didn't put it in the slideshow, if you could convince moose, elk, and deer to use those egg interchanges on the asphalt. And they did remove a strip about 10, 20 feet wide of asphalt on each interchange so the animals could walk on dirt. But I monitored for three years on Lance Canyon, two years in Mountain Dell, no deal. Mountain Dell has a firing range, and, oh, and then the, the way the, the bridges were put in both those places, those bridges were built somewhere else and then dropped in place, and so there's a bang, 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 bang when big trucks go. So the sound is problematic. There, I do have a picture of a moose going through at the same time that SUV was going through at Lance Canyon, but. Um, Elk, forget it. No elk, a couple of deer, a couple of moose. But so you can't get animals to share interchanges like Parley Summit. There's no, there's no way they're going to go through that. Well, they do use the on ramps and off ramps. Yes, yes, they do they like that. Right the off ramps. I chase them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know there's some more questions. Yeah. Can you share a day you have on before and after with reduction of roadkill? Oh yeah, I'm going to try and do that tomorrow night. Um, I mean, sorry, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Um, so um, that, that, that app that I showed with the big dots, um, I can say that dozens of deer and elk and moose were getting killed on this, in, this, this strip of highway I-80 before we put the fence in. And now it's down to a dozen maybe, but I'm not sure. I have to go back and I, I, I go periodically and I still see animals getting hit. So we're, we haven't figured it out yet. But they, we reduced it. I would say we reduced it anywhere from 50 to 70 percent, but there's still a problem. There's still definitely animals getting killed. But where are they going? See, that's the thing that drives me crazy in this field. I was actually very hesitant to get in this field. We, we like pat ourselves on the back that we put a fence up and they're not getting killed on the road. Well, well they're piling up on the hillside, starving to death. You know, like, fencing is not the answer. So that's why I'm really happy to hear about the overpass. Yes. So what's the tentative schedule for you not putting in that overpass? So they're, they're designing it right now. There was a meeting, there's another meeting in two weeks between UBWR and UDOT, and I try and inform you UBWR, and then 2018 is supposed to start, so in another year it should start. It should be nice to get, I'd say in 18 months it should be up. And they want it right now, they have the span. I was talking with Pam Kramer today. Um, the span doesn't have a support in the middle, which is kind of odd. Um, but to do that, they can't put a lot of soil on it because it has to really hold itself up. And there's a lot of lanes of traffic. It's over 300 feet long. Um, so um, they're trying to figure out how to genetically 
Yeah. Oh, excuse me, west. west. It'll be west. Yeah. 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 It'll be near. It'll. It'll be near the Parley Summit exit. But I believe it'll be between Lance Canyon and Parley. Yeah. 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 Yes. On the technology side, it's good news. The new cars, like the Teslas, that have mm -hmm. crash avoidance, mm -hmm. they're really good at seeing stuff that we don't see. Yep. And the newer cars, if you want to, it's a good reason to get one now. Yeah, they have infrared technology yeah. that we yeah. see it on the dashboard, yes. and the car will slow yeah. you down. Right, slow you down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the future. Helpful. That's the future. Precisely yeah. in your life. Yes, up there. How effective are the uh, overpasses in Canada? They're massive. Fabulous, because they they're growing trees on there. So they have they have grizzly bear. They have everything going over. They even have the occasional wolverine and lynx, which are really really reclusive animals that we've never seen. So they've had they had twenty when they had just twenty four. Well, they have twenty. They have more than twenty four. But when they had twenty four crossings, they they hit the hundred thousand mark really quickly because they have so many crossings. Because Canada has more money than us. What? So I guess Canada has more money than us. Well, they, what they did is the DOT, the Ministry of Transportation, gave the money to Parks Canada. Parks Canada designed them, and, and Terry McGuire was the um, uh, engineer, so that's one of the reasons it worked out so well, is Parks Canada cared and made sure it happened the way it should, versus the uh, Ministry of Transportation. Yes, Ross? Uh, I've been told by you, Doc, that in mid-April, you're going to have an open house at Richard's library. So we'll put it, I hope everyone looks at Save People, Save Wildlife Facebook site, and we will be posting on there more information about it. But UDOT will have an open house to explain everything, or most of what we're discussing. So. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say, I said this when, when, when Save People, Save Wildlife first got together in the fall of 2015, I guess. Um, I got into this business a long time ago with the mantra, DOT is right, we will not embarrass you in front of everyone. And that worked so well. And so um, as pissed off as you might be, you need to treat the people who are your champions the best you can and say, we will help you. And Save People, Save Wildlife brought money to the table, which then makes you a much more um, an able player. And so, um, uh, gently pushing. I mean, you guys are you're experienced adults. You know how to like you know motivate children and motivate people to get the lawn cut or whatever. And so you have to get them excited and motivated, and then stay on them, saying we're in it for the long haul. We're not just going to go away after this fence is up or the crossing here is going. We're going to support you, and we're not going to you know we don't want to let you look like that's really important because the individuals you work with are not necessarily the problem, but they need your support from the outside. Yes? Is, I've lived in the state for three years, and is the urbanization of some of the mountain communities really affecting um, how wildlife is treated? Mm -hmm. um, particularly like, I live in this area, but if you go out to Canvas and you go out 248, You've got Browns Canyon, you've got Deer Mountain, and you have a horrendous wildlife kill out on 248 there. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because they're probably trying to get down to Jordan L to get a drink. But are the counties and the planning committees looking at the urbanization of the mountain communities and even the traffic on I-80 from Vernal coming on 40 and going down the refineries has really dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. How is that playing in? Well, um, we're all, I looked in the mirror and we're all guilty. So we're moving into their home ranges both the winter and the summer. So the animals are getting pushed to the road because you know our developments are right where they used to be. Then of course, um, oil and gas development, those trucks don't, trucks do not stop for wildlife as you know. It's too dangerous, so they just plow right through them. So yeah, all that multiplies over many times, and then um, it's not necessarily the DOT's fault, but the DOT has to do something about it. And so you pressure UDWR and the DOT that, um, I'll give you an example. 
Um, Dan also, I mentioned earlier, he went and collected carcasses along the road to look at how many more animals are dead on the road versus the crashes. And his numbers estimate that 17,000 to 20,000 mule deer a year are killed on roads in Utah that are administered by UDOT. Now, UDOT only administers 25% of the roads, and they are the killing roads, but there's plenty more roads out there that they don't administer, like county roads that deer are getting killed. So our populations of deer versus, say, white tail in the east, they can't sustain what's going on. So you, it's all these different factors coming in. And the, you know, these, these two counties here are the most progressive counties in the state, and you guys have the answers more than anyone else does, and it takes everybody working together. Just the bottom line. <laughs>